Um, hi, my name is Chris DeBona. Uh, I look after open source software and a science outreach group uh, for the company, uh, the company being Google, for the people watching on YouTube. Um, uh, Rob, uh, I, I guess I, I got to meet Rob uh, because I used to work with his wife uh -huh. some 17 years ago. And then I, I got to meet Rob while he was banging his head uh, against the music business with Rhapsody. Yep. Uh, and, and we were doing TV. So uh, long and short of it is, uh, Rob rejected all this technology business stuff and decided to become a science fiction author, which uh, was very endearing, of course, to all of us. And so I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on me. I want Rob to kick it off. Oh, I will, I will say, um, the After On, it, it's not just a book. It's a podcast. It is and now. It's the same name, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, it's the After yeah, yeah. On podcast, uh, focusing on you know the future. The future, yeah, right? the near uh, future. Uh, of, of, of things. So um, we, we, we should have time for questions at the very end, um, if you like. And I'm just going to hand it over to Rob. And thank you so much for, for coming and, and talking here at Google. Thank you for having me. All right, so um, uh, I'll, just a quick intro on what the story is, as you guys have all seen in the corner. This is the book, although yours will not come with post-it notes. Those are for me. Um, and it's called After On, and it's basically the story of an imaginary startup um, based up in San Francisco. It is set in um, almost present-day San Francisco. It's actually set nine seconds into the future. So whenever you start reading this book, it takes place nine seconds hence. So it is incumbent on the reader to read very rapidly, lest it be set in the past. And as you can see, it's a thick book, so that's going to be a challenge. And this company <clears throat> is called Flutter, P-H-L-U-T-T-R, because we know how to spell. Um, is, you know, it kind of embodies everything that's wrong with social media, maybe dialed up by about 20%. So we're in the world of satire, but definitely not the world of farce. And this is gonna sound like a spoiler, but it really isn't. Um, about midway through the book, Flutter attains consciousness. And I say it's not really a spoiler, because you're gonna see that coming almost from the first page. And, um, you know, being a social network, it, it doesn't turn into some kind of terminator that wants to kill us all, because it is a social network, so it becomes something far more frightening, which is basically, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm coming, getting over cause, basically a hyper-empowered, super-intelligent 14-year-old mean girl, basically, and, but super-intelligent. And that's kind of the character that Flutter enters the world with initially. Um, now, I'm gonna talk about the book in great detail in a moment, but first, let me give you a quick structure of, um, of uh, overview of what my remarks are going to be. I'm going to talk briefly about my own background because that feeds into this book an enormous amount. Um, then I'm going to talk about how I dealt with the science and the tech and also some geopolitical issues that are in the book um, because it is basically you know present day and I wanted that stuff to be as accurate as possible and in fact um, a couple of Googlers helped me try to ground things in the present day. Um, then I'm going to talk briefly about how the story is told uh, because it's told in a somewhat unusual way. And um, I think it's, it's kind of fun and it's, it's, it's grounded in the way we consume media today. And um, then I'm going to talk maybe a little bit about the dialogue that I see happening in society over the decades between science and science fiction, or between technology and science fiction, which I think is really healthy, and maybe a couple of ideas about how we might be able to step that up. Um, and um, I will probably read little bits and pieces of the book through here, and I say that with some trepidation. You go to like a normal book reading, um, people often comment that the worst thing about the reading is the actual reading of the book. Um, I'd say it's usually the wine if you're at a bookstore, because it's usually like a buck a gallon, and that's you know got its own sort of traumas. But I'm going to weave a little bit of reading, <clears throat> and then we'll, ho we'll hopefully have time for Q&A. So first of all, um, a little bit about my, my background. Um, as Chris noted, uh, I am uh, kind of from your world. Uh, not a company of this scale, but I was a venture-backed uh, entrepreneur for a period of time. I was briefly a VC. Um, the company I started uh, created the Rhapsody Music Service, which was kind of Spotify before it was Spotify. We were the first company to get full catalog licenses from all the major music lab labels to distribute music online. And we did basically create the unli unlimited streaming model that Spotify and, and, and Apple and, and many others have since adopted. Um, I ended up selling that company and um, became a tech investor 
And um, I think it's fair to say basically started um, meddling in my wife's career quite a bit. Uh, she at the time was hosting a TV show that covered the world of video games and video gaming. And we were living down in Los Angeles, this, this city built on storytelling. And um, I had always been very, very interested in writing fiction. And at some point, I think maybe she got tired of my meddling in her career. And she basically commanded me to sit down and write my first novel. That was called Year Zero. Uh, it's the tale. This was kind of based on my experiences at Rhapsody to a certain degree, in that it's the tale of this vast alien civilization that's so into um, American pop music that they accidentally make the commit, commit the biggest copyright infringement since the dawn of time, and there, thereby bankrupt um, the entire universe. Um, and uh, it's based on a true story, by the way. And um, so that was my first novel. And I thought it was just it was something I was doing really for myself. I thought it was something so weird and so unusual that maybe Larry Lessig and my wife would read it and nobody else. But I did end up getting it. I had an agent because I'd written a couple business books before. Um, I got it in front of the folks at Random House. And they ended up publishing it. And it actually very briefly and barely, sort of like a prairie dog, got under the New York Times bestseller list for the shortest period of time, which is a week uh, that's possible. And I think it was like number 23 out of 25. So it's, a, you know, barely. But that was good enough for Random House to say, keep at it. And so I started writing this book. Um, it's unusual. And in fact, I might be the only person who's done it um, to transition from, you know, kind of the venture-backed startup world to writing fiction. Now, lots and lots of entrepreneurs write books, write nonfiction. I don't know of anybody else who's made the transition to writing serious fiction, although I'm, I'm, there, there could well be somebody out there. And if so, I'd love to meet them. Now, there's upsides and downsides to that. I mean, the downside is it kind of sucks that when you go to one of those meetups for entrepreneurs um, who have turned into um, novelists, you're inevitably the only one there. Um, the, um, on the positive side, though, it's really good for newish novelists, and this is only my second book, so I consider myself to be newish, to really focus on that which we know. And we are at a time when I think society is very, very interested in our world out here, which I tried to depict very vividly and very accurately in this book, the world of entrepreneurs and investors and the crazy relationship certain products might have with the press and beyond, the geniuses that inhabit and populate and work for companies like yours and so forth. That's often depicted in a way that's just very fanciful by folks who've never spent a day in a tech company. I will definitely accept HBO's TV series, though, which often is hysterically spot on. But a great deal of the storytelling out there really, really misses the point. And this is at a time when society, I think, finds us very interesting. And our significance to broader society is, is becoming really significant. But I think the better our story is told and the better that it's reflected out there, um, you know, frankly, hopefully the less people will fear us on a certain level, or at least the better they'll understand us and that which we do. So that's, that's something that I think is, is kind of cool. Um, so that's one element of my background that's deeply, deeply embedded <clears throat> in this book, and it's the most obvious thing. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, the second thing is um, I spent a huge amount of my time of my early adulthood roaming around the Middle East, um, I, including, uh, I, I went, uh, including a year as a Fulbright Scholar in Cairo, Egypt. Um, I went all over the place. I've been to Syria, I've been to Lebanon, I went to Iraq under Saddam, um, I've um, Jordan, Gaza, all over the place. Since I was living there, and I, I got to the point where I spoke reasonably good Arabic, although it's rusted a lot since then. Since coming back, I try to get back to the region at least once a year. Um, and uh, as worked as an elections observer, I work as a pro bono advisor to a lot of startups out there. Um, I work with a not-for-profit out there. And a certain element of my background in the Middle East um, comes into the book as well, because issues of nihilistic terrorism and what causes it and what could prevent it, and lone wolf terrorism in particular, are prominent in the book. It was something that impacted me um, kind of tangentially. Somebody that I used to spend a lot of time with in Cairo was actually assassinated shortly after I left. And it, Cairo had been a very, very peaceful place until the early 90s. And it was really when this, this um, associate of mine, Farag uh, Foda, was assassinated that kind of touched off a, a, a fairly violent period in Egypt's history. So that's something that um, I've, I've thought about quite a bit over the decades, frankly. And the third thing is I'm actually a proud alum 
of the New York City foster care system. And uh, issues of parental ties and familial belonging are, are quite big um, in the book. So those three themes are the sinews that come together in this book. And again, as a newish writer, one does write what one knows. And I think that's an exotic enough mix um, that, it, that it leads to a fairly um, unusual story. Now, as I mentioned, um, I did a ton of digging into the science and technology that imbues this book, because writing something that's present tense, it's easy, it's a, there, there's quite a temptation, I think writers of speculative fiction have, to create things that are just flat out magical from the standpoint of present day technology, inject them into the storyline, it can make your story a much easier thing to tell. But I kind of think that's irresponsible storytelling and it's, it's particularly irresponsible in the realm of speculative fiction because I think there's a presumption on the part of at least some of our readers that they're learning stuff about how the world really works and how technology really works, particularly if a book is set in the present day, or at least that's how I approach things. And so the first thing that I did is I started writing this thing is I conducted actually hundreds of hours of interviews um, with lots of folks who were deep in the various realms I wanted to cover. And I'll add, this is one of the coolest things about being a science fiction writer. Um, I mean, if you call up a relatively prominent scientist or technologist and say, hey, I'm a journalist and I'm writing a story, you might get a call back. If you say, hey, I'm a, a podcaster and I really want to interview you, I've been doing a bit of that myself lately, you might get a call back. Man, if you call up and say, I'm a science fiction writer and I want to get your input on a new novel, it's about 90%. So you get really good access to people because I think a lot of folks grew up on science fiction. And there's something kind of fun about being involved in the creation of that. Um, so the areas that I dive, dove into particularly that I hadn't known much about um, getting into this. One was how might a super AI actually arise? I didn't know a whole lot about neuroscience uh, or consciousness theory at the time. I spent a lot of time with a diversity of neuroscientists, none more than a guy at UCSF named Adam Ghazali, uh, who's doing fascinating work. And if you're interested in sort of the cutting edge of neuroscience, particularly as it associates to video games and how it might impact neuroplasticity and help us fight horrors like Alzheimer's disease and autism, and ADHD. There's lots and lots of talks on the net um, by Adam, and he became a great mentor and informant to me as I was writing this. And in fact, his work has been on the cover of Nature, which I'm sure, as a lot of you guys know, is a really, really big deal. Um, when I was researching quantum computing, another major topic in this book, I spent a lot of time with Google's own Hartmut Nevin. Um, and he corrected a lot of kind of laughable misperceptions I had about quantum computing, which was a really cool education, and I remain very grateful to him. Synthetic biology is a major theme here. I'm sure many of you either know or at least know of Jeff Huber, um, who I've known for decades. Um, at the time he was running life sciences, I believe, I might get the title a little bit off, at Google X, he was a great source for me. So what was cool about this is I got all of this learning as a result of writing this book, which is the joy for me of writing any book. And I've written nonfiction as well. And obviously you learn a lot from writing nonfiction. And then I start writing this thing. As you guys can see, <clears throat> excuse me, it is not short. You should have seen the first draft. The first draft was about 800 pages long. And you know, I, go, I hand it into Random House. They're like, we're going to have to chop down a forest for this thing. So it was clear that I needed to rein it in. And the thing that I was most guilty of is when I learned about a domain of science or tech or geopolitics, because I learned, I learned a lot more about certain domains in geopolitics. When I, when, I, when I got deep into something, I was all too likely to just like, in the middle of the story, and the car is about to go off the cliff, and let me tell you about how cool synthetic biology is for 20 pages. Um, you end up hijacking your story, and the more you know about something as a novelist, the more inclined you are to do that. So I kind of had this problem, because I really wanted to infuse all this stuff in the book. Um, but you know, I was hijacking my story. So what I ended up doing, and I, I think this is, I don't know if any other fiction writer has done this, and again, there probably are some out there, and hopefully I'll find others, because again, the meetups are just me. But um, what I decided to do is to create a podcast series to accompany the book 
in which I could do really, really deep interviews with domain experts in seven or eight areas that are most germane to the book. So I could go into the, and in, in many cases, not all, but in many cases, I was interviewing the person who had been such a great sort of mentor and informant to me as I was doing my research. So I started putting these podcasts out when the book came out. The book came out last month. And the eighth one went up, actually, I guess last night or the night before. And it's about Fermi's paradox, which is this really cool thing in astronomy, which is like, where are all the aliens? It's actually a very scientifically significant question. Why can we not see signs of extraterrestrial intelligence? So you're into that. I've got like a two-hour conversation with a British astronomer on the web now. It might be the longest conversation about Fermi's paradox ever recorded. If it's not, I'm sure it's the longest one ever podcast. But but anyway, so I'm able to get really, really deep with these podcasts. And I did one on augmented reality. I did one on quantum computing. Um, I certainly did one on super AI risk, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's kind of how I dealt with the science and technology. Now, the last thing, or the second to last thing, I told you I'd talk about. And this is where I'll start sprinkling in some readings. Um, how the story is told. So it, it's great that you guys have the physical book, because you can flip through it and see that there is there are a lot of very different sort of type settings going on in here. And the reason is about 75% of the book is told in the form of like a traditional narrative. Um, it's, there's some flashbacks. It's primarily set in the present day. There's a chunk of stuff that happens right after the bubble burst, the internet bubble around 2002, where half of the characters are still in high school, and the other half are kind of like young entrepreneurs that are freaking out and saying what just happened. Um, so there's a little bit of flashback. It's mainly traditional narrative. But the rest of the book is told through all these different media types. There are 18 Amazon reviews in the, this book. Yes, really. And the story is genuinely told partly through them. There's lots of tweets. There's SMSs. There's five or six very, very voicey bloggers, some of them very angry about certain things that are blogging in there. There are excerpts from a second novel, which are a little bit mysterious when they first start showing up. Um, I, I put probably a dozen or f maybe a little bit fewer excerpts in the book. I'm quite convinced if I finished writing this second novel, it would be literally the single worst science fiction novel ever written. Um, but they're in there for kind of storytelling reasons and also for playful reasons. And so that was kind of a cool thing to weave all this stuff together. Now I'll tell you guys, um, I'm going to read one of my Amazon reviews because I think the Amazon reviews are kind of fun. Um, and they actually have an interesting backstory. So when I was running um, Rhapsody, uh, or the company that built Rhapsody, I should say, um, it was really stressful. I actually didn't think I was a particularly good manager. Um, I kept that a really good secret for a while, but eventually it started getting out. And um, I, I was, you know, every night, like after I was done with all my email and all my managerial responsibilities, I'd kind of sit there and do this self-indulgent thing. And it was actually writing these insane Amazon reviews. This is back in 2002. And I took on the persona of this sort of insane Bostonian, Charles Henry Higginsworth III of Boston, Massachusetts, who would start writing these, these Amazon reviews. And you get about a third of the way in there. And then he'd do this 180 and start just bitching about his life. And you know he was from this formerly wealthy family that had blown all its money. And they were living in this crumbling mansion on Beacon Hill. And they didn't even have money for heating oil because you know some great aunt had spent the last of the money or something like that. And he had this really sort of pompous voice that I just had fun writing. And so I started writing all these Amazon reviews. I almost became a top 1,000 reviewer. How cool would that have been? Answer, very. I didn't, though. Um, and so when I started creating this book all these years later, um, I realized I wanted a certain character. It's a minor character, but a significant character that had a certain set of traits. I'm like, oh my god, I want Mr. Higginsworth. And by the way, yes, please use Mr. when you refer to him. He prefers it that way. And so I started weaving in his Amazon reviews, all of which are still up on Amazon, dated 2002. So I think some people think this is like boyhood. Oh my god, he's been working on this for 15 years. Not true. But I did repurpose my Amazon reviews. So this is one of them. 
Uh, this is a review about, and it does relate, I swear, to the plot of the book. Uh, this is Mr. Charles Henry Higginsworth III of Boston, Massachusetts, reviewing a book called Time to Make the Donuts, The Founder of Dunkin' Donuts Shares an American Journey. So here it is, his title of his review. From the kitchens of Boston to your left ventricle is the title of the review. Five stars by Charles Henry Higginsworth III. I kind of felt morally obliged to rate everything five stars, because in most cases back then I hadn't actually read these books, so you know. Um, so he says, like a charmed wind hurling vital provisions on a castaway's beach, fate landed a copy of this in our conference room, in which I served a recent sentence to traffic school. As reading was a scorned pastime amongst my fellow inmates, I laid easy claim to the volume, a mental sop for a mind numbed by the day's prattle. I was soon swept up by this tale of an intrepid entrepreneur's rise to the heights of the glamorous but cutthroat world of donut retail. I meanwhile enjoyed no small surge of civic pride, Dunkin' Donuts having sprung from the loins of my own native Boston. The narrative is sprinkled with little known truths about this breakfast staple. For instance, did you know that the modern word donut descends from dough nut, which itself traces lineage to the archaic dough not? Nor did I, sir, nor did I. Short on complex formulae in your lengthier words, this is ideal reading at events at which attention must be feigned. But be advised, this could impair the absorption of important lessons from without. I myself learned this the hard way when I caused a minor accident upon leaving the, school's traffic, the traffic school's driveway by failing to signal, neglecting a major leitmotif from the day's curriculum. My instructor, who had resented my divided attention throughout the day, savored the irony. Like, what a pompous jerk, right? Um, so anyway, that ended up getting stitched into the book. And now one of the cool things about having, okay, so the reason that I brought all these different media elements in, just to back up, is I feel that this is the way we engage in stories today. It's the way we engage in news stories as they unfold. In some ways, it's even the way that we engage in narrative stories because you know we might be watching snippets of something, but we're watching it on demand, so we watch three minutes here and four minutes there, and then we might end up reading a summary of that episode somewhere online and then kind of go back to it. I feel like this barrage of snippets of, of media, of texts, of blogs, of, of Amazon reviews and the rest is kind of the way that we in we inhale the world today. And the novel itself, you know, really is primarily the earliest ones go back to the 17th and 18th century, but it's really a 19th century invention um, for the most part. That's when it really came into its own. And the attention spans that we had and the way that we engaged in relationship and careers and everything else was so much more linear and start to finish and so much more focused. Um, that I thought it would be kind of fun to inject some of these elements into sort of this ancient mode of storytelling. Now another uh, dimension of it, which is kind of neat, is when you have all these different storytelling elements, when you do an audiobook, you can recruit all kinds of very distinct and different voices to that audiobook. So these Amazon reviews, um, that are of which there are about a dozen and a half, and I cannot do justice to the reading compared to the actual reader, all read by a guy named John Hodgman, who is a brilliant comedian. He was very frequently on The Daily Show. He's been in lots of TV series and movies. He is perhaps best known for those famous commercials, I'm a Mac, I'm a PC. If you remember those from some years back, he was the PC. Um, he is Bostonian, and he just reads these reviews in this really, wonderful, kind of stentorian, pompous voice. I just did my best, but I'm not as good as him. Felicia Day uh, is beloved by lots of geeks for having created The Guild, that wonderful web series, and done a lot of other things. She was frequently in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Slayer these days. She's in Mystery Science Theater 3000. Um, she was one of the voice of one of my bloggers. Um, if anybody listens to This Week in Tech, Leo Laporte is the voice of the San Francisco Chronicle. Tom Merritt is the voice of the New York Times. Um, Patrick Rothfuss, who writes amazing fantasy novels, including The Name of the Wind, just read it, trust me on that one, It's also got this great big kind of, he can do these rants, these playful rants in this over-the-top manner. So he read that crazy, awful science fiction novel that's excerpted in here. And so you can have a lot of fun with audio. And, and audiobooks are just a really, are really coming in their own as a medium right now. Um, it's, audiobooks are growing at something like three, I mean, like probably 10 times the speed of publishing itself. Um, I was told my last novel was about four and a half years ago 
when this came out, the folks at Random House Audio told me um, they're actually, their business is up by over 300% four and a half years, which is more like tech rates of growth, which is a whole another interesting topic. Um, so that is the way the story is told. Now, um, I'm also going to do the other thing that I do that's a little bit unusual. And I'll do a slightly longer reading right now. And it will piss you off, or it should. It's intended to. Um, there's this weird narrator that appears at the very, very beginning of the book and then kind of stands back a bit um, and kind of comes in periodically to just sort of jab you and say, don't forget about me, I'm still here. So it is a book with a narrator, but it's a very, very soft touch narrator. And again, that's, it's not unique, but it's something that's a little bit unusual um, that I do for reasons that kind of become evident, I'd say, not until the very, very end of the book. So don't peek. Um, the, the narrator's actually not revealed until the last two or three pages. Um, but I'm going to read the opening page and a half or so, which is when this narrative voice uh, maybe a little long, yeah, about a page and a half, is most present that I'm going to say a couple things about it. So this is how the book starts, starting from the first word. Some people think all great books should start with a dare. And those folks can't be big readers. Because really, when was the last time you read a book that began with a dare? Well, this one does. And that's not some ham-fisted gambit to position it as great, because we just established that only half literates conflate opening dares with greatness. So it's truly just a simple dare. And it's this. I dare you to finish the fucker. And let's be real, you probably won't. It's 547 pages printed, after all, which is to say any number of locations, sections, or lit nodes in your e-reader. And its obnoxious length is nothing compared to the disquieting truths it reveals about a popular social slash messaging slash hookup platform that humanity already spends 11.2% of its online time engaged with, about who really built all that and why, about who's listening and what they're recording, and, here's the part that may smart a bit, how terribly uninteresting they almost certainly find you. There's also some truly scary stuff you just don't need to know. About the February bombing in San Francisco. About how it actually saved lives, lots of them, and quite possibly your own. And about how moronically close we came to a nuclear war with China on a recent winter's day. Spoiler alert, not my fault. You don't have to know any of this. And ignoring the hidden ugliness we can't do much about makes life easier. So if you tend to avoid facts like the age of the kid who stitched your favorite blazer just outside of Phnom Penh, or how athletically a certain ex once cheated on you, or how painful and scary the last few days of most human lives are, then for God's sake, put the book down. Then do yourself a big favor and catch a movie. A numbered sequel, say, starring cartoon men invented to distract tots during the Roosevelt era. You'll find that plenty challenging and much more fun. It'll also be over sooner, leaving you free for more numbered sequels, or maybe some of the light sci-fi written for the bright teens and dim grown-ups we euphemistically call young adults. Are you still there? If so, I I'm sorry if that sounded a bit mean, but we're better off with whoever just stomped off. Those people offend easily and are always whining about how they feel unsafe or undercherished if their every clumsy kick, catch, and volley isn't commemorated with trophies. <laughs> I can't stand those people. I bet you can't stand them either. So getting rid of them was worth feigning contempt for some of my own favorite things. Psst, two of the best movies ever, in my view, are Iron Man 1 and 2. Also, I read YA stuff constantly. I bet you didn't know that. Now that it's just us, I applaud you for at least attempting to see this thing through. Even you probably won't get there, those 547 pages again. But if you do, I can make you three promises. One, I will never talk down to you. Yes, certain facts herein are hard to confront and accept. Certain others are plenty hard to understand. But I think you're man enough, woman enough, or young adult enough to handle it all. So, no sugarcoating and no dumbing down. Two, I'll never lie to you. Everything that follows, however fantastical and hard to believe, is entirely true and precisely depicts the underpinnings of the world you inhabit. And finally, at the very, very end of all this, you will find a glittering prize. Books that end with glittering prizes are even rarer than those that start with dares, so lucky you. But please, no pixies. With that, I'm almost done with you. And that may be welcome news. My tone can grate a bit, I know. It's probably just a phase I'm going through. But I'll give you your space now. That said, I will check in every so often. Sometimes when you least expect it, as the hitmen say. And of course, I'll be back at the end with that glittering prize of yours. 
and you'd thought I'd already forgotten. But for now, let's begin our story with some quick opening praise for the women and men of Silicon Valley. Yes, yes, I know, but those fuckers gave us Farmville. It's true, and everyone's awfully sorry about that. But at its best, the valley remains an inspiring land, almost bewitchingly so. I mean, where else can a handful of misfits meet up in a garage, share mad bolts of inspiration, the mainline Red Bull, sleep under desks, code on bleeding fingers until they hack together an agenda-setting product that will rock the world? and then register their millionth user in just weeks, their 10 millionth in mere months, and forge friendships and talents that will last a lifetime, all while getting vastly, shamelessly, pornographically rich. The answer, of course, is Austin, Seattle, Beijing, London, Oslo, Bangalore, Seoul, Nairobi, Dubai, Buenos Aires, and quite possibly Perth, Australia, among countless other places. But this sort of thing happens on a grander scale in Silicon Valley than anywhere else. And the cliche is dead accurate. We're designing the future here. We also designed the present, and you're much better off for that. Snort at this if you must. But do you really want to go back to six broadcast channels, CB radios, typewriters, dominoes and checkers, rotary phones, and thermostats that don't even speak a single word of English? Didn't think so. So yes, Silicon Valley did give us Farmville, but across the decades, its countless startups have also rebuilt our world's foundations. Some relentlessly advanced the microprocessor, enabling the digital wonders of our era. Others honed DNA sequencing, which cracked the human genome and will one day help to cure cancer. Still others pioneered wireless technologies that are finally patching together the world's poorest sectors into a global superplex of information. Literally thousands of Silicon Valley startups in these and countless fields have advanced humanity in palpable ways, and no matter how you cut it, however imaginatively, generatively, even generously, even schizophrenically you look at things, giftishly was never ever one of them. Nope, not even close. So then we talk about giftishly. Now, every time I read these pages, <clears throat> I kind of want to strangle my narrator um, because I find the tone so spectacularly obnoxious, which is good because I worked very, very hard on that. And like I said, and like the narrator promised, the narrator said, I know my tone can grade a bit. I'll get out of your way. The narrator does that, but like I said, comes back from time to time to poke you. And I'd like to say more about the narrator, but I'd give certain things away. Um, so I'm going to close just with a quick note on the dialogue that I think we've had as a society and as a, as a world of creators on my side and as a world of creators of tech um, and science on, on your side and formerly kind of my side. Um, between science and science fiction and technology and science fiction, just a show of hands, how many folks before you decided to enter, at some point early in your life, much earlier in your life, before you decided to enter tech, were in some way inspired by science fiction and maybe attribute your, your presence now here at Google to some inspiration from science fiction when you were young? Yeah, yeah. So it's about half, and that's generally what I find. I mean, it, it is something that I think can be very, very powerful. And I feel, you know, the science fiction that personally intrigued me the most when I was a kid um, I loved super deep future stuff, things that pointed to things that were improbable ever and certainly not going to happen in my lifetime. But the things that got me most excited and then pointed me, although I, I studied Arabic and Middle Eastern history in college, I wasn't an engineer, but drew me to the industry, were those stories that were told kind of in the intermediate future that really, really excited me about what might happen. And um, so uh, I've been talking to a couple people, including this gentleman, Adam Ghazali, who I mentioned to you, about maybe trying to create sort of like a semi-formal council-like thing between creators of science fiction and creators of science and technology, where maybe we could like, you know, pair up in some way and, and, and maybe get groups of people to create short stories that maybe we release on an annual basis where there's a scientist or a technologist teamed up with a science fiction writer. We set things in sort of like that 10 to 25 year time frame, which can be so inspiring. So I think there's really two things that people who write about the future can do. One, and we've been doing less and less of this recently, we can depict the future that we want to inhabit. And science fiction used to do a lot more of that. Science fiction used to be much more optimistic than I'd say it is now. Dystopianism has just pervaded the field really in the last 25 years. Um, but that optimistic message <clears throat> is very important. But so is the dystopian one, because I think works of speculative fiction also depict the worlds that we absolutely do not want to inhabit under any 
circumstances. And I would say there was a lot of magnificent storytelling during the Cold War that did a lot to freak out hundreds of millions or billions of people at how bad a nuclear war could actually be, things set in the near future then. And I think that helped us avoid that fate, at least until now. Um, and I'd also give George Orwell an enormous amount of credit. We don't really think of 1984 today as being a work of science fiction, but it was. He wrote it in 1948, and things like telescreens and so forth were way beyond the technology of the day. And you could be forgiven as a smart person in 1948 looking at the world and thinking that a completely totalitarian future was all but inevitable. Because on the left, you'd had Stalin and the horrors that he perpetrated. On the right, you had Hitler and the horrors that he per perpetrated. Clearly, a totalitarian regime was going to take over China at that point. And it looked like we were heading for that. And I think that 1984 freaked out, again, hundreds of millions of people that how bad this future really could be when combined with technology that was then right on the horizon, you know, video conferencing and video dis dissemination. Um, so I think he helped us not inhabit that future. And I, I think that's an important mission for science and, 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 and technology-based storytelling. And the more that that can be done in sort of a partnership between the writers and the people who create the future, who genuinely create the future, sure ain't us, um, the better. So those are my quick words uh, on this crazy book. Um, I'm open to any questions. Um, and yeah, fire away. I just started watching the Vietnam series that Ken Burns is doing. It's magnificent. Right? Started last night. It's amazing. Episode one. And I'm thinking, wow, there's going to be 14 hours of this. Yeah. So your book contains all of these tools and, and exchanges and contexts that we now enjoy that are seconds long. Yeah. And maybe minutes. Mm -hmm. Rarely hours. Yeah. It's kind of interesting. You know, I just, what are you thinking about? Like, why did, what is it that Ken Burns says, you know, gee, I'm going to make this thing 20 hours long and people will love it. Well, you know, hey, Ken, this is 22 hours long. <laughs> uh, it, no, and, and it's, a similar, it's a similar mindset that I think that anybody who creates very, very long form entertainment, we're really battling horrific headwinds. And so I think I can speak very, very directly to that. I mean, the audiobook of this is 22 hours long. It's 547 pages, 191,000 words, according to my word processor, in a you know, in an era that lionizes the 140 character tweet. And I mean, I think that if you are, are dedicated to this level of depth, you, you're, you better not be in it for the money. <laughs> now, I think Ken Burns has done very, very well over the years by telling, you know, historical stories brilliantly well. But I, th I think, A, you better not be in it for the money, and you better have an extraordinary commitment to this very, very long form that you're engaging in. And I think, secondly, it's really incumbent upon you to use the medium uh, to, to convey a message that simply can't be conveyed in other ways. And um, I think that, you know, again, to go 19th century, even the 1950s or 60s, you know, there, there, there was probably more call for a novel that kind of really just sort of maybe conveyed the type of experience that you could get from watching playful TV or something like that. In an era now where people have so many claims on their intelligence, there's so many on their time and intelligence, and there's so many brilliant ways to spend that time. I mean, TV has never been better. I'd say film has been better, but TV has never been better. Um, you really, if you're going to make a statement that's 20 hours long, um, you better make a statement that simply couldn't be conveyed in another manner. And I, there was um, uh, uh, Sam Harris has has a very interesting and at times controversial podcast. Um, I actually interviewed him for my own podcast. For we had a two-hour interview a couple episodes ago. Uh, he had Ken Burns on. I think his last episode or the one before. So it's the one interview that I've heard. And he interviewed him at great length. And I think that Ken Burns, based on the interview that I heard. Um, felt that he had a story whose sweep and scope simply could not be told in less than 20 hours. And therefore, it was something that merited this, this very big footprint, very rarely deployed tool that he had. And um, I think that there is absolutely call for the novel and the 20-hour documentary. Uh, in this day and age, and you know, there is a very interesting phenomenon. We now have 13-hour movies. For all intents and purposes, the really wonderful premium cable entertainment, the, the great serialized things that are going up on Netflix and Amazon and, and now Hulu, and, and I know you guys are doing some buying, they really are 13-hour movies. I mean, if you look at something like Breaking Bad, um, 
that's something that the distribution and economic infrastructure that we live in today enables. And it turns out people have attention for 13 hour movies. So I think that the very long and very, sh I, I think there's there's room for all attention spans. Um, I love listening to sprawling audiobooks. Um, I love an audiobook that is that clocks in at 20, 30 hours. Um, because, you know, I can sometimes I listen on 2x speed. Uh, as a New Yorker, I do a huge amount of walking and subwaying, and I've got a little dog, and boy, New York's the land of a thousand walks for her. And being able to, you know, to really s to steep in something that long. It's also interesting, there's some very, very long podcasts out there. Um, you know, Sam Harris and Tim Ferriss, I cite them because they rhyme, uh, but they're also both very popular. They tend to have these like one, two, three hour conversations. They're very, very popular podcasts. So I think, I think our attention span is, is pretty robust. And it really has got to be targeting that thing to the right amount. And I love the fact that the 140 character snippet has, is vibrant and is connected to by billions. That had no way to get into the world until 10 years ago. And it turns out we actually have a lot to say at that short time frame. And I'm glad that the world's media infrastructure can accommodate that too. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>